in the world. So <laughs> the, the big government, I mentioned it, and here it is. <laughs> uh, it's more effective than our own individual and, and, and collective uh, you know, capacity. And uh, this is, of course, I'm bringing here ideas from Yuval Noah Harari and, and, and others. If you agree that our global future depends at least in part on this micromanagement of emotions, like fear, the question is not so much how is the world going to change, but are we collectively and individually going to change in any fundamental ways? So which fears I'm talking about and how do we deal with them? Obviously, this crisis brings the fear of death to the fore. Anyone can die from the virus. But I want to highlight another fear as, as important, the fear of stopping, of uh, why are we so terrified at the prospect of slowing down? It's uh, revealing from these two fears, die versus stop, uh, how they were played out by Trump's uh, staging of this crisis. I guess there are advantages of having such a, a spectacular president who loves the screen so much. It's very transparent, right? At the beginning, the panic of slowing down the economy dominated him and his administration and paralyzed any sensible action. Then someone came up with this beautif beautiful model pre predicting 100 to 200,000 deaths, right? And while many of Trump actions remain largely, largely insensible, despite of the model and, and the fear of, of that, um, he, his tone changed significantly from, you know, the cheerful comedian to a somber bearer of bad news, at least for one or two days. Then it uh, changed again and entered a total insane blame game, which anyone could witness on TV if one had the stomach for it. So th the point is that fear of death overcame the fear of a slowing down the, the economy. That's the point I want to make. Something that climate change with all its modeling has not yet been able to achieve. But then playing the, the blame game was, I think, a classical reaction of someone who resists self-transformation. One does not need to change when it was someone else's fault, right? And Trump is not the only one shielding himself from change through blaming others. We are all doing it to a certain extent. So we can only hope that we will not need to come to hundreds of thousands of deaths to finally act on climate change. But the point here is that to avoid this massive climate related death, I, I believe we will need to find another way of overcoming our collective fear of slowing down. We can use the, the COVID, uh, the, the question is, can we use the, the, the COVID-19 crisis for that? So uh, I, I have been myself advocating for decades that society should slow down. And I was finally managing to slow down my own life a bit, a bit lately. Yet I must acknowledge that I still got scared at the sudden halt brought about by COVID-19. Not to the point of running to Walmart to buy toilet paper, but you know what I mean. And uh, a, key step, a key step to overcome any fear is to name it. So, I'm going to propose right now a chat storm. Uh, so I'm going to invite anyone to use, use your chat. And uh, if you agree that uh, we are all scared uh, at slowing down to a certain degree, what words would you use to describe that which needs to be slowed down or that will, will likely slow down anyways, independently of what we do? And, and here and is important, that makes us afraid, individually or collectively. Perhaps you are not scared about it, but uh, you know someone who is. So, you know, I don't see any, anyone writing anything, but uh, if you feel inclined, just, ah, I see someone. <laughs> Ooh, slower pace, being, being unproductive. Okay, purpose, very good, very good. This, this is, goes very well with what I want to say next. So I, I would like to change gears as you continue, you know, sending perhaps, oh, that's lack of power, sending, sending uh, chats. Um, I would like to change gears and talk a bit about the ideas of a Korean German sociological philosopher, Byung Chul Han, I don't know whether you know him. Thanks to this quarantine, I was able to devour his devour his books. For me, he's the, the Foucault of the 21st century. So Byung, Byung Chul Han distinguishes between negative violence, which comes from outside from an external enemy, and positive violence, which comes from inside, 
and it's the dominant form of violence in our burned out society, as, as he called it, or achievement society. Positive violence is the violence that, that we exert on ourselves in the name of our, of our own freedom. We have internalized the enemy and now it's inside us. We no longer need a boss to coerce us into work. Now we work because we want and everything in our lives becomes work. Even when we are outside the workplace, our cell phones and our cell phones, we constantly work for the system by pr providing our personal data in the form of likes and dislikes, for instance. So we are all the time working because we define ourselves in terms of our achievements. We are all entrepreneurs of ourselves, achievement subjects, and this self-exploitation is the most efficient form of domination that there is. I believe that this is total, this total identification with our achievements is key to understand why we are so scared of slowing down. I would like to invite you to another chat storm or if you are done with the, with the previous one. And uh, perhaps type words that describe unproductive activities that you or someone you know have already uh, uh, practiced during this, this quarantine thanks, thanks to this crisis. And uh, the challenge here is how to define unproductive activities, right? Because uh, um, what, what I mean is activities that you cannot reasonably add to your CV, but uh, of course the tendency now is to add anything to your, to your CV, right? So let's, let's say, you know, things that you wouldn't have done otherwise uh, that are not um, perhaps very significant if you add them to your CV. <laughs> That's much more Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, David. Uh, we, uh, we will now continue with Brett, uh, and then afterwards we have a, a more joint discussion. I will, we, will, we can keep track of all the kind of unproductive things that people are, are, are sharing. Um, so, Brett Allenby, um, a professor in engineering and ethics at uh, uh, Arizona State University, um, you have some slides you want to share? Yeah, let me, uh, let me toss this up. I'll go through these very quickly, but there'll be copies if people want them. Um, so the first is, am I coming through okay? Can everybody, uh, everybody hear me? Yes. Uh, All right. So I want to start out with following up on the theme for, for uh, uh, for this particular session in a, in a different way than, uh, and I hope complementary way to what, what David said. I want to I want to look at the bigger picture. And I want to emphasize as I do so that what I'm talking about are scenarios, not predictions. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I think we tend to forget because we're in 24 hour a day uh, COVID-19 information uh, tsunamis is that politics and geopolitics, adversaries, uh, the weaponization of narratives, none of this is stopped. In fact, it's accelerated, but because we're afraid, because we get too much information, uh, we're less and less able uh, to be rational in the environment that we find ourselves in. So a couple of basic lessons have already become clear. The first is resilience and efficiency are opposing values. Uh, competition had driven both companies and countries to being relatively efficient. And what we have found is that when faced with an unexpected challenge, that meant a failure of resiliency, which is what we're living through now. The second thing is, we all talk about resilience, but resilience is expensive. You've got to pay for it. If we wanted to keep a huge uh, supply of ventilators all around the country, that would be incredibly expensive. So the question is, how do you figure out how to invest intelligently in resilience? Brad, uh, a moment, please. You want to maybe share it in the presentation mode? Um, is it not in the presentation no, mode? No. Uh, okay, because it's coming over with me in the presentation mode. Yeah, so I, I, we are seeing the first slide. Um, you're not seeing the third? No. no. Why is that happening? 
maybe you can go click on well, I'll tell you what let me end slideshow and just do it this way and see if this can you see it now yes now we see the fourth one yes all right well I'll just I'll just do it this way then yeah okay um so uh so we've learned the resilience is expensive the third thing we've learned is that resilience is systemic uh, because a lot of us come out of science or of ecology uh, or out of engineering, we tend to think of it in technical terms. What was become very clear is that incompetent leadership can undermine any sort of resilient system uh, when you get into human systems, which is clearly what we're in the middle of. And finally, I think that we can talk about efficient investment in resilience, but to do so would require far more sophistication than we bring to this kind of discussion. Because we all tend to roll in on uh, our normative uh, 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 war horses. And the problem is that when you're in a situation like this, it doesn't care about what your normative war horses are. It responds the way it responds. So our choice is really to learn from this in spite of our normative perspectives uh, or to simply fall deeper into our narratives, which is what a lot of people do. I'm not going to go into this slide. The reason I put this in here is simply to show you that uh, it is possible if you have a large network to be able to deploy resiliency in a highly competitive environment and to do so intelligently. This is one example. It just happens to be one I'm familiar with because I used to work at AT&T. But what this means is that we can, in fact, do better uh, if we bother to learn from the experiences that we're in the middle of. And I think that that's, that's an important thing to understand because the tendency is faced with this kind of challenge uh, to sort of fall into a, a uh, helpless feeling. And that's, uh, I think, not appropriate. Some of the possible impl implications of the pandemic. Here's where the scenarios come in. Remember these are scenarios, but remember that we may be able to do something about them if we understand them as possible outcomes. Uh, the first is that we are likely to see a more high-tech world that is dominated by increasingly large and powerful firms. This was certainly the trend coming into this. Uh, uh, think of the large American high-tech firms, think of Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. Um, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of power in these organizations, and the extent to which they become powerful may be reflected by the extent to which the nation state becomes less and less competent. Um, take a look at the United States right now and think on that. Uh, the second is life will become more virtual. Uh, truth will become more tribal. In the United States especially, and especially if you tend to be on the left side of the spectrum, we tend to talk about truth as if everybody bought into that as an important value. That's not, in fact, the case. And I think the sooner we learn to deal with a post-truth environment where narrative becomes dominant, uh, the more effective we're going to be in responding to the challenges uh, that COVID and more broadly, the response to COVID are going to pose. Uh, the rise of nationalism is part of a movement back to fundamental narrative. Uh, and I think that that's, again, something that is, has been happening for a while, but this is accelerating it and emphasizing this. Uh, we'll see an increase in corporate power and cronyism. I think that that's inevitable as corporations increase um, the ability of others to challenge them, particularly if the challenge is purely economic, is going to diminish. In the U.S. in particular, I think we're going to see a shift of power from the federal to the state level. The incompetence of the federal response uh, and the competence of many of the states, not all of them by any means, but many of them, um, is remarkable. And I think we're also going to see on the other side a shift from federal to corporate, uh, precisely because of the incompetent federal response. 
Uh, for example, a lot of people are saying that if we're going to go to a uh, partial relaxation in the United States, you need two things. One, you need to have testing, which we don't have despite all of the protests of the, the vice president. It's not there. The second is you need to have con uh, contact tracing so that you can keep track because we don't have good data on what COVID is actually doing and how it's transmitted even when you've already had it. So you're going to need tracing. Now you're not going to get tracing out of the federal government. You're going to get tracing out of private firms that already know how to do it for their own purposes. So the question is, um, how does this begin to shift power in fundamental ways? Uh, some other possible implications. Well, one is obviously that the idea of universal basic income uh, uh, has been advanced at least implicitly. Whether it will stick or not, probably not. But the idea is advanced. It's been there. And if it turns out that there is a sufficiently disruptive evolution, for example, there's a massive uh, rise in, in uh, unemployment because of the uh, uh, deployment of, of AI in, in things like trucking, uh, transportation, retail. If that happens, we've already got uh, the idea of UBI to fall back on, and we've, in essence, implemented it in a crisis already. I think it's also fairly clear that American democracy will continue to fragment and to flail, indeed, to fail. Um, once the election happens, particularly if we're still working with COVID, even in a secondary way, it's going to be much easier for those who would choose to, to argue that the election was not legitimate, unless, of course, they win. Uh, and even, uh, even raises the potential for civil war. Uh, I think that the, these ideas are non-trivial, they're very low probability, but to not think about them and consider them um, is an abdication of responsibility, both on the part of uh, those who are still trying to lead the country, such as the military, but also on the part of academia, where we tend to try to avoid things like the real world of power politics and um, military-civilian uh, uh, relationships. Soft power uh, remains the battlefield. This is a huge opportunity for countries like China, um, that they're not taking advantage of it fully has more to do with the fact that the Chinese uh, have moved towards a hard authoritarianism. Had they remained in soft authoritarian mode, uh, they could have made significant inroads on soft power, cultural power, uh, the attractiveness of a culture. The United States, of course, is throwing away uh, its soft power daily uh, simply by, by appearing uh, so foolish and incompetent uh, at the federal level. Uh, I think we'll probably see less privacy. Uh, privacy uh, may well become uh, perceived uh, not as something that is a free public good or a right, but as something that is not just illusory, but is a very expensive middle class luxury that is being purchased on the back of the poor and the powerless. Uh, if we don't do uh, contact tracing, for example, uh, it will be because the middle class and the elite do not want to do it. Um, and the people who are gonna pay for it are the people who are dying disproportionately already from COVID, the poor and the powerless. There's some very significant shifts going on here and I think to ignore them uh, is inappropriate. The rich get richer and the poor get poor. That was true back when Ain't We Got Fun was written uh, and it's uh, more true now. If you look at who uh, those who are able to distance themselves from the disease, and those who cannot, uh, you begin to see uh, quite obviously that the rich get rich and the poor get poor. But more importantly, you also see, um, and there's some recent data in The Economist for those of you that want to wander in that direction, that the impact of recessions and particularly this kind of impact with COVID and a recession tends to be far greater on the poor than on the wealthy.
Um, that certainly is something that one way or another we're going to have to deal with. And I want to end finally with disinformation. This is a huge opportunity. Um, there's a report today in the Washington Post talking about the fact that a few uh, gun rights people have been able to use Facebook to essentially put together the anti um, distancing uh, 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 demonstrations that we've seen in states like Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, that the US president appears to be supporting. Uh, that's a very few people and they're using disinformation very effectively. They learned it from uh, 2016 when disinformation was deployed so effectively in Brexit, in American elections and elsewhere. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, there's still a lot of disinformation being actively deployed because if you have any pretensions to world power, this is not just a crisis that you need to manage internally. This is a golden opportunity to go after adversaries that may not be addressing it as effectively as you are, or may be weaker because of their political structure. Um, the the uh, one about the vaccine is very interested. Uh, interesting. These are, by the way, generally Russian initiatives, although what we find more and more is that uh, domestic groups pick up the Russian initiatives very quickly because they've been attuned to that source of information. Once domestic groups start talking about it, of course, you begin to run into very difficult questions of, of free speech, particularly protected political speech. Um, the interesting thing is about the focus on vaccinations is that this ties in with previous campaigns uh, which have supported the anti-vax movement. What all of that supports more fundamentally is an attack on science as a socially acceptable source of truth that you can then base arguments on. So what we have in this case is we have a, um, uh, a reflection of and a deployment of deeper themes which are very powerful disinformation thrusts by uh, adversaries such as Russia, North Korea, China, uh, and Iran. These are in full force now, and if you see them playing out in American political discourse, uh, it's because uh, that's by design, and if you don't see them, playing out in American political discourse. It isn't because they aren't there, it's because they've been adopted by domestic players uh, and uh, disguised in that way. So that's kind of what I had and I look forward to a discussion. Okay, well, thank you, Brad. Um, these were quite uh, diverse perspectives. Um, and uh, so I will keep an eye on the, the, the questions that people have. And uh, but also I'd like to start with one observation. I see David is, is thinking more about reflection and we now seem to have um, more time. I, I don't experience that myself, but um, I, I know some people um, uh, experience that, uh, but the, the presentation of uh, Brad indicated actually this is a, a period where we cannot really reflect that much because it's it's a, it's a very intense period where a lot of change is happening and uh, we have to be on our toes to to experience what what what's all happening and as as mentioned resilience is, can be expensive so we see uh, that I want to see what David's reaction is on, well, let's see the reaction of each other on each other's uh, uh, talks. Uh, or do you, I don't know whether you see a kind of a, um, a different perspective of, of both of you. Uh, David? You well, yeah, I think um, we have complementary but uh, different perspectives. Uh, my focus is more on on the hu human factor, I guess, uh, the human revolution that, that may emerge from 
from this uh, situation. And uh, I think Brad focuses more on the structural conditions and how these conditions are going to evolve and and how also how things are how people are going to behave. But um, for me, the, the opportunity is more on on uh, people changing uh, themselves uh, in radical ways. Uh, and uh, and the virus is not going to change us. Change it, uh, us is it's but it, it creates perhaps conditions for us to do that that we have to do anyways if we want to to address other 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 crises that are that are coming. Yeah, yeah. and I think I think that um, in in some ways it's very helpful to have um, David focusing on the the personal uh, growth, personal intuitive aspect, and me focusing more on some of the broader um, uh, tipping points of history kind of aspect. And I think the reason is that with any crisis like this, you have both of those uh, positions, they're both very strong, they're both compelling, um, and in some ways, they're both mutually exclusive. I mean, it's it's a fascinating part of being human. So I think I think both of us are speaking to the human condition, um, and they're both they're both equally valid. That's the problem. Uh, I think I think I sort of tend to come back to when I was in high school, and some of the guys that that I knew would would go over to to Vietnam, and they'd come back in body bags and. And you'd look at that and you'd realize that there are times when, when you as an individual get caught up in the tides of history and your ability to change them in spite of all the agency we purport to have is very low. Right now, the tides of history are flowing very powerfully and very fast. I don't know whether they can be deflected in good directions or not. I hope so. But if we don't understand them, our chance of deflecting them in good directions is zilch. Okay, so uh, there are a number of comments about narratives and narratives related to truth. And I also think about what uh, David's uh, statements is also in a way about narratives, narratives about production and as a, uh, how we how we are productive is also kind of a narrative uh, so um, how do you um, maybe you both see that that it's uh, uh, science <coughs> is maybe maybe we we are going through a narrative change in in the different dimensions about narratives about in in the media but also narratives about how we uh, fill in our our lives. Yeah, well, I think the the narrative that uh, puts uh, productivity as the overriding factor for everything, right? That's that's something that uh, this crisis or other crisis or independently of crisis uh, probably uh, needs to be challenging because that's that's what is creating many of the problems that that we have. Uh, it's not that productivity is not important, but when it becomes the overriding factor that uh, you know overrides every, everything else, uh, then then it, it's uh, it can be really de destructive. So for me, that's the main narrative that we need to focus on in terms of um, disabling. But of course, I I believe Brad can see many more nuances in in that. Well, not necessarily nuances. I think the problem, it's not a problem, it's a condition. I think the condition is that we live in a world where information has essentially overwhelmed the critical uh, uh, faculties of the individual and our institutions. And so the result is that uh, we're not able to make sense of the world as it evolves around us to begin with you put COVID on top of that, and you find most people essentially falling back on whatever core narrative um, they're most comfortable with, uh, which for most people tends to be sort of cultural or religious. 
Um, if, if your identity has been, has been shaped by the narratives that the right has been using in this country, you fall back on that. That's why, that's why the people demonstrating are so vociferous. That's why it was so easy to get them out, even though it was only a couple of brothers that apparently put together a lot of these campaigns. It's because that narrative is core to their identity. I think one of the things that we haven't grasped is that, is that the battle spaces today and this is true whether you're a nation state, this is true whether you're a corporation trying to figure out how to use the power that you have been granted by the forces of history. The, the narrative today that, that, that counts in the battle space is identity. And identity itself has become a battle space. It's being shaped by narratives that are put together um, for particular purposes by different people, and some of which, of course, simply come out of history, uh, religious narratives, national narratives, exceptionalist narratives. Uh, and I think that, that when you see the US fragmenting uh, and you see the, the federal response and the state response, part of what you're seeing is the failure of the US exceptionalist narrative. And that means that all of the secondary narratives suddenly become much more important, suddenly become a matter of identity. And that means that regardless of what happens in the short term, in the long term, you're going to have a fragmentation and even more focus on narrative um, as a weapon uh, and narrative as a dangerous force in an unsettled world. Yeah. And I, I would like to add, uh, given the importance of narratives, as, as Brad uh, mentions, uh, what is the role of science in that? Because data and information uh, don't create the uh, knowledge, really. I mean, the, the data system that we that we have is is just uh, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have a like a time behind it in terms of the the narrative time that 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 requires that. So are we are we supposed to just uh, keep producing data or we should get into the business of narratives even given that they are so crucial for the future, right? Yeah, so th there are a few questions related to to academia and the role of science. So uh, one is uh, a question about uh, uh, power in science, so uh, who has power in science and how do they may impact uh, uh, also the, uh, uh, the, the the ethics in 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 um, uh, about how we are. Uh, I, I think that relates to your your, your comments too, uh, David, about uh, what are we gonna do? Who are setting the uh, agenda? And um, and then there is also a question about uh, uh, yeah what's the role of science in the broader debate if if um, um, the leaders of some countries see science as fake and uh, not useful uh, although they are confronted now with it something that they cannot really um, easily uh, uh, set aside. So what's the kind of, maybe you both have some reflections on the role of science in this, uh, this time, in this crisis. Well, uh, my, my perspective is that, um, that we, we need to end the exceptionality of science as, as being outside of culture. And we think that we have to recognize that there is a scientific or technical culture and as, as such, it produces uh, narratives, even though we don't acknowledge them, uh, or, or even though they happen at a, we pretend not, not, to, not to produce narratives, but, but we do. And I think we, we have to pay more attention to that, recognize that uh, science produces data, and, uh, but also it's, it's a culture that produces n narratives. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, you know, uh, scientific revolutions. Kuhn clearly demonstrated that the the objective idea of science uh, uh, is limited by its cultural dimensions. It you know, science is interesting in this because on the one hand, it's clear that knowledge about 
COVID, knowledge about testing, knowledge about the medical impacts, what it does in the body, uh, whether or not uh, you're immune after you've been infected, uh, is absolutely critical uh, to policy. But on the other hand, um, there's also uh, very powerful questions about the role of science, certainly within certain groups. I mean, that's why the disinformation attacks that focus on vaccines are so potent, because there's a lot of people that accept science as only a narrative. And so you have, you have the problem that science is understood as being part of, a necessary part of the dialogue, but on the other side of the coin, you have a lot of people that are viewing science as only a narrative, and therefore the test of science is not whether it's true or not, which of course is the way the Enlightenment would, would approach it. The test of science is whether it fits with my narrative or not. That is to say, from behavioral economics, whether it fits with my confirmation bias. So you have very different approaches to science. And part of what uh, some of the disinformation campaigns that we're already seeing are targeting is the split in the United States. And I'm talking about the United States because we have better data and more information about these campaigns in the United States. Uh, you're seeing them target a large uh, percentage of the population in the United States that does not accept science unless it agrees with their underlying narratives. And that means politically that your ability to achieve socially stable solutions may be attenuated. Now, you know, pluralism is always messy. Right. I mean, there were riots during the Civil War about about the North shouldn't be fighting the South and everything else. But we're seeing some very interesting and messy debates now that even though they may be about things like whether we should open up or not or whether you support the current president or not, are really about whether you accept science as a legitimate source of truth or is simply another source of facts which you can use to support your own narrative, whatever it is. And also related to that is, uh, can we measure the, the quality of, of narratives? Is, is there a way of assessing from science uh, what effects different narratives have, right? For instance, uh, yep. not just uh, any narrative is uh, the same. To, to no, absolutely. Uh, and that's, you know, that's part of what's in play now. Uh, when you talk about emerging technologies with students, one of their immediate responses is, well, <laughs> come on, let's just not do this. This is a bad idea. Uh, and the problem is that you might have been able to get away with that in the 1950s or the 1960s when there were only a few dominant cultures and they tended to view science similarly. But the problem now is that you have a number of different cultures. Um, at the very least, you have China with the Confucian culture and Europe and the United States with what you might call a Western universalist culture. And they're loggerheads and they're competing across the board uh, very, very powerfully. And what that means is that even if we think it's a bad idea to do something, it doesn't mean it isn't gonna get done anymore. Uh, we don't control the world anymore, which goes to the problem of ethics in a world where you have very different cultures that are asserting themselves, many of whom do not buy at least part of the Western universalist approach to say human rights um, and, and the proper role of science. It's a messy world. But then they, they may, may contribute with other, other values like a sense of community that is different to the one that Western science. So there may be opportunities if, if we are able to, to have some sort of dialogue. Uh, but uh, of course, when you, for that you have to recognize the other as exactly. different and, yes. as, and as having something to offer to you. And our Western yep. attitude has been, you know, uh, for many centuries to uh, recognize or uh, assume that everyone is the same, right? And everyone eventually will become Western <laughs> at some point. Uh, so unless we get out of this, this colonial mentality, it's going to be very difficult to have uh, like a 
positive conversation and lots of conflict may may come i don't know how things are going to settle how the dust is going to settle but yeah. right? <laughs> well, yeah. none of us do yeah. okay i have a question from maria which is addressing uh, uh more about better potential positive uh, uh, aspects come out actually i saw yesterday an interview with uh, jane goodall who was uh, uh, staying in the in the uk in lockdown uh, and she indicated that uh, uh, well she hopes that there might be some good things coming out of it uh, in terms of uh, thinking about the different uh, uh, changes to uh, that we have to make changes to avoid uh, uh, dangerous climate change etc so um, so question here is uh, if we don't want to waste COVID-19 are there ways that we could do to to yeah to improve our uh, the resilience in, and I think the question is also related to environmental related problems so what are some windows of opportunities uh, that that may lead to changes that in the end we don't waste the COVID-19 but may actually lead to uh, uh, some also positive changes um, in the future. Well, well, for me, the key thing is to to reach a, a sense of community that is different to to what we had before, both both uh, globally. Uh, I mean, to realize that uh, we are part of this global community, of course, but but more um, at the individual level. Um, I think uh, these, uh, many of these problems, climate change and all that, come from this uh, individual, individualistic culture, right? And, and this uh, achievement, achievement society and, and a way of uh, understanding uh, ourselves as uh, entrepreneurial subjects. And uh, so I think we need to uh, a step down from this obsession with productivity and get bored um dedicate time to do nothing to contemplation to to be invest in, in in relationships and things like that it's i think it's that's that's the opportunity that this this crisis and climate change and other crises uh, offer us i believe and i guess <sighs> yeah you know, i i always seem to to come out being the pessimistic one here. Um, uh, I, think the, I think the problem is that uh, what all of us have failed to understand is the point that, that um, uh, David made earlier, and that is that we live in a world that is, uh, if you will, uh, neo-medieval narrative, that is to say, there are many, many competing narratives, and they are not subject to our control. And so the problem is that environmentalism has let itself become one of many narratives. And so what, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to say that the environmental narrative is the most important narrative and it trumps everything else. And the difficulty is that we may accept that, but there's a lot of other narratives that don't. And so so the difficulty that we run into is that those of us who may be very supportive of environmental values uh, may not be as accepting of other people who may disagree with us profoundly uh, in order to reach the, the point David made about we need to learn to talk to each other even when the other is very, very different. So I think that there's I think that there's possibilities certainly for environmental improvement. Um, if nothing else, uh, uh, we haven't we haven't burned a lot of fossil fuel that we otherwise would have burned. That's a good thing. Uh, but uh, I think that we need to be we need to accept the world as a highly complex place where we may have values that we understand as important. But we need to also be able to work in that complex space to achieve results that are uh, stable and long lasting. Becoming enamored of our own particular narrative, whatever it is, uh, may not be the best way to do that. And also uh, related to that, this idea of uh, the other, and I think uh, 
the, our our sense of mobility and our way of travel may may change as a, as a result of that. Uh, this uh, touristification of the world that we we're creating places everywhere that are all the same. You go no matter what, and you find the same thing all over. And as as we develop this appreciation and capacity to 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 the appreciate that which is different, the other, I think uh, that that can change. That can the the accelerate this uh, touristification and and uh, in a sense nonsensical uh, traveling. You go. Uh, many miles away to find what you already have at, at home, right? So I think that there are many possibilities in terms of uh, how mobility is going to change uh, in uh, after after this, after having the experience of being grounded for, for many months and and creating the, all these obstacles to, to, to movement. So I want to uh, go to a question of uh, Nino, uh, where the question is, uh, I do not know whether you have followed uh, uh, what's happening in, in other countries because the, the presentations were very US, uh, largely US focused, but uh, there's a lot of different type of responses and uh, around the world and, and, and countries where have very different approaches uh, to to deal with uh, the COVID-19. And I do not know, it's a, it's a kind of an interesting, uh, kind of um, experiment in, in governance, but uh, maybe you have some uh, reflections on, on this too, whether what, what you have seen in, the, in different countries. Well, I think, I think it's clear that, that there are lessons about resilience and systems that are more resilient than others uh, across the world. I mean, if you, if you look at, for example, South Korea, um, it's a, sort of, it's, it's very democratic, but it has a, a population that trusts the government somewhat. And, and so you look across the world, and I think what you can find as a generalization is that where you have societies with a high level of trust, you have better luck, particularly when you're talking about things that are very severe, like, for example, shutting down economies. Um, so I would say if you look at other countries, you see some where you're doing brilliantly. South Korea, I would, I would say. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions about China's response, and I don't want to minimize those, but the Chinese responded, I think, particularly for a very large country, reasonably well. I think if you're going to hand out uh, failing grades, um, I think you look at places like Brazil. Um, uh, Bolsonaro has, has uh, certainly not responded well, and uh, they may end up with a lot of problems. If you look at countries where you don't have the capacity, again, the rich-poor divide, that becomes critical. The United States, at the federal level, has basically botched a lot of things, but we're wealthy enough that we can make up for some of that. If you go to Africa, you don't have that resource. So you begin to see, I think, a lot of different dimensions of resilience. A really good study, it's too preliminary because we're in the middle of responses and you don't know what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Is Germany, for example, going to be effective letting people go back to work? Very interesting questions, very hard. What about Israel where you have difficulty with a certain, uh, 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 the, the very orthodox communities? How do you respond to that, particularly given the politics there? I think what we're going to find is that the fragmentation of politics, which is clear in some countries, the US, uh, for example, uh, becomes a significant source of fragility, even when everything else could point you towards resiliency. So it's a fascinating question, and it's one that's going to require a lot of serious study, um, uh, not just a, a, an offhand comment by the likes of me. <laughs> but the, I think the issue, issue of mistrust and mistrust in the government in particular is key here, because um, when you look at the digital surveillance, for instance, the problem is not so so much about the technology. The problem is that we don't trust that the, this technology is going to be used 
in a way in which our privacy is going to be guaranteed because um, we're used to to share our data with our doctor for instance but we understand that they are not going to to you know that there is an intrinsic uh, trust there that uh, our data is going to be safe but uh, when it comes to governments and, and corporations in Western democracies, as, as Brad was saying, the level of trust is much lower than, than in Asia. And that explains a lot of what, of what has happened. Not only, uh, the same with Germany, Germany and Italy, Germany and Spain, the levels of trust in the institutions are rather vastly different. Okay, well, th yeah, that's, I think, uh, a, a great, area for a lot of uh, future research, uh, uh, especially from a, a more political science perspective. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of comments about narratives and, and China at the moment. Um, I think the narrative will be, I think, one of the narratives coming out of this discussion. Um, let's see whether some other kind of questions. So um yeah we are reaching the end of the, the the hour i don't know whether you have some kind of closing remarks on what might be good to uh to to uh yeah to conclude in a way from uh, uh we are i think in a probably in the beginning of a of a kind of transition and so uh it will be if we continue to do this uh this event uh, in the, the coming uh, months uh, on a regular basis i would be interested to see how the the narrative is changing too of these discussions um, so also to the people who are listening in if you are want to be one of the panelists um, uh, uh, let us know so we can have a diversity of perspectives in the, in the coming time maybe brad and uh, david you may have some closing uh, remarks well, I, I'll just read a quote from Byun Chul Han, which, as you know, I like him uh, a lot. I like his ideas a lot. And uh, this is uh, from something he wrote. It was published in a Spanish newspaper, but uh, it hasn't been translated to English. So uh, Han says, uh, we cannot leave the, the revolution in the virus, virus's hands. We have to trust that after the virus, a human revolution will come. It's we rational people who need to rethink and radically constrain this destructive capitalism to save ourselves, the climate, and this beautiful planet. So I'll, I'll let it there. Okay, thank you. And again, I think I come out uh, um, sort of from a different perspective. I think that the, I think that history indicates that when you're at a tipping point, there are many good things that disappear as, when he as many bad things. And I think that uh, we can't and shouldn't be naive or dismissive of the pressures to be productive, of the pressures to maintain power, of the pressures of competition. So if we, if we think we want a world that is going to be less competitive or less driven, uh, we need to have a realistic way to get there. And the realistic way is not at all clear from here. The level of competition between large companies, the level of competition between nation states and between new entities uh, is as high as it ever was. And all of them are smart enough to know that like the title of this set of presentations, COVID is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to exercise power. It's an opportunity to increase your, your leverage, uh, your ability to manage the future, uh, and uh, to damage your adversaries. So the fact that we're overwhelmed with COVID information should not blind us to the fact that that information, even as we talk here, is being used to try to manipulate the future towards the ends that a lot of different and very powerful entities want. We have to be realistic, and I think that that's part of the realism. So would it be nice to have a wonderful future? Sure. Is it going to happen, particularly if we don't understand the world the way it is? Not quite as obvious. Well, um, the, the, 
thank you both for your uh, contributions. Um, um, I, I, I hope that we could have a series to see what we may learn to uh, uh, maybe not get the utopia life that we may aspire, but at least to avoid some of the dystopians that uh, uh, Brett is always good to uh, point to. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much, both of you, and um, yeah, I will look forward to uh, see a, a, a next discussion. We don't know yet whether we will, uh, when that will be, but probably in uh, two weeks we will have another uh, webinar panel. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Good, good to see you as always, David. Yeah, likewise. <laughs>